Oh, yes. right, okay. Yeah. All right, greetings, everybody. We're about to get started again, so if I can ask people to grab their refreshments and settle down and take I your seats. I never wanted one in the first place. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's my pleasure to introduce, and I guess we'll just keep on talking, and eventually they'll realize there's a panel going on. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce, to moderate our second panel, Alan Wersbicki, a senior editorial writer for the Boston Globe, who will introduce our second panel. Thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, having me here. Um, I was hoping to start by just taking the Americans in the room back to the morning of November 9th, which is a time I think many of us probably remember very well, uh, waking up and thinking, how did this happen? Um, that's uh, a question that many of us still don't really have a good answer for. Um, it's a lot of analysis, a lot of talk, a lot of debate about what exactly happened last year, as, uh, as Hillary Clinton puts it. Um, Thailand has had a lot more time to think about that question in the context of its former prime minister, uh, Thaksin Shinawat, who was elected in 2001. And uh, we're joined today by our two panelists to help us understand uh, what Thailand's experience was and what it can teach the United States. Uh, so our panelists are uh, Pesit Vejajiva, the uh, former prime minister, and Duncan McCargo, who's a professor of political science at the University of Leeds. Um, I guess where I want to start was just at the equivalent time in 2001, when this election had just happened, take us back to what the, uh, what the situation in Thailand was like at the time, how the conditions um, came to be that he was able to win this election, and sort of with the benefit of more than 15 years of hindsight, how do you think he was able to be successful? First of all, let me thank uh, Matthew uh, for inviting me here. I should start by saying that I must be the only politician uh, in this room and uh, on the panel. And given what was said in the first panel, I should explain that I am a politician, but I haven't achieved the level of success to qualify me as a psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> What I have been trying to do is, uh, of course, uh, during much of the last two decades, of course, was, of course, fighting populist leader um, from Thaksin Shinawatra to his successors. And uh, your first question, I guess, is probably the easiest, trying to uh, recount and retrace his path. And I should say right at the outset that uh, when I was invited, I was uh, particularly pleased because uh, before November 9th, uh, I saw what was coming. There was a lot of disbelief about the electab electability of Donald Trump. But for many ties, when we saw him on a campaign trail, we sort of recognized what kind of uh, politician, and what kind of leader he might turn out to be. And uh, I was then joking to my American colleagues that finally Thailand will be able to teach the US <laughs> about something. And uh, I hope at the end of this panel, I will have, uh, with Duncan, given some insights on how these uh, leaders behave, how they rise to success, uh, what kind of uh, style of government you could expect. Uh, the one thing that we don't yet have an answer to, of course, is how to defeat <laughs> these kinds of leaders. And uh, that's something that I think proved to be the most difficult question on the first panel as well. But uh, I, I have to say this because uh, too often, uh, whether we're politicians or academics, we're obsessed with the details. And we think that the context or the social economic environments in in each country is different. And we fail to see the common trends. We fail to see uh, the similarities between what has been happening in, in our countries. Um, and I was particularly struck because only a couple of months ago, when I uh, represented my party at Liberal International, that the whole of the Liberal International meeting this year, and it was about two, three day meeting, was all about how we could possibly deal with the rise of populism and populist leaders. And from South Africa to Venezuela to 
a uh, number of European countries, it was clear that there's so much in common. And I should also say that uh, going back even 12 years, when I first became uh, leader of my own party, I had a delegation from Italy. At the time, they were the leadership of the Margarita Party, wonderful name for a party. <laughs> um, and I was puzzled why they wanted to see me. And uh, the first words that came out from the delegation was that, we have a common enemy. <laughs> and uh, we were trying to learn from each other how we could possibly uh, deal with this kind of leadership. So I hope that you will begin to see that the experience from many, many countries will be very valuable as to how you should, you should move forward. Now, uh, what happened in 2001, um, there are, I think, three key factors that allowed Thaksin to win the elections and became uh, a leader that he, that he did. First of all, um, Thailand had just been through a very tough time after the financial crisis of 1997. And we, the Democrats, actually inherited um, an agreement with the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, to put through a very austere program, very unpopular program, in order to stabilize um, the economy. Actually, I recall well that when uh, my party leader at the time was about to become prime minister, I mentioned to him that, uh, as far as I know, there's never been a government that's worked with the IMF that gets re-elected. <laughs> and, and I actually warned him that, because I spent a long time in, in Britain, that when la the Labour Party worked with the IMF, it took them 18 years before they were able to get back into government, to which his reply was, it's okay, you're still young. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, basically, uh, after going through very tough times with the IMF package, although the, the economy was stabilized, clearly people were unhappy. And there was a backlash, a resentment against, I guess, the ruling class. And this should be familiar to you because uh, you experienced the 2008 financial crisis. And the feeling was, the governing party, although they may have done a good job from a technocratic point of view, somehow was being isolated from the feeling of the general public. And that gave an opening for an outsider to come along and play on the nationalistic feelings, resentment against globalization, resentment against the ruling class, and that they wanted somebody different, that somehow all the old politicians, professional politicians, were part of the establishment that were not working for them. Now, added to that was the fact that uh, Thailand has also had a long history of rather messy and corrupt coalition governments, because no party has been able to win an outright majority, parties, uh, governments had to be formed by, uh, through negotiations, and often uh, they were not able to implement the campaign promises. So people had a very cynical view of the, uh, the old politicians. So Thaksin, despite actually having been in politics before, rather unsuccessfully, spent the IMF years forming a new party and rebranding himself as an outsider as somebody who has been successful in business that could come and fix the economy for most Thais, right? We also, at the time of 1997, uh, put in place a new constitution, which enabled um, political parties to become more consolidated and therefore would have a stronger government, indeed, the, even a possibility of a one-party government. And uh, the third factor, I guess, of course, was uh, Thaksin himself uh, very successfully um, uh, introduced what I would call modern campaigning into Thai politics. So very 
skillful marketing techniques. So while he projected himself as a, an outsider, somebody completely new to politics, his party was actually made up of almost the, all the old politicians that he successfully, shall we say, bought to join him. And so playing on the fear, playing on the, um, the feeling of dissatisfaction, disillusionment, um, offering something that is new, and having successful communication skills, I think were the basic factors that contributed to his rise. And when I say it like this, I'm sure you recognize what was happening uh, before November the 9th. People were generally unhappy uh, with the economy, even though I guess the previous administration has successfully guided um, uh, the American economy from the crisis, but it was not really felt as a successful or, or a tangible benefit that the general public had. Uh, you had somebody coming from outside who, again, was saying that he, was, who would, he would do things differently, that he was not part of the establishment, he wanted to clear the swamp or whatever the, the expression was. And also he had the, uh, the skills to, to communicate. Um, whether we like it or not, but uh, he connected with the emotions of, of the people. Uh, I recall the time, actually, when he was still uh, uh, in the early stages of, of campaigning, that I was wondering whether his potential supporters took him seriously or literally. And it was clear that only his opponents were taking him literally. But his supporters were not particularly obsessed with the details of his policies, whether they would be uh, possible to implement, but they felt that he was addressing their problems in ways that other politicians didn't. Taksin also had a, a good set of policies to appeal to people for the first time, particularly the, the, the vast rural population who probably for so long felt disenfranchised uh, so he promised the village fund, he promised the health care, uh, he promised debt forgiveness, and so on. Um, those policies, barring the, the, the health care um, system where universal coverage was the was a target, uh, were not particularly technically successful, mm. but, again, the people felt at least they had someone addressing their concerns, something that they felt had been ignored for a long, long time. So I think that's how we see him uh, rise to power. Uh, and then, of course, we'll, we'll have to later discuss how he consolidates or builds on that success. Duncan, what's your uh, take on sort of what forces put Taksin into power? Thanks very much. I'm in an interesting situation here. I normally get to speak with academics, uh, and never before have I sat on a panel with a, a former prime minister. So I'm now trying to explain to you about the supposed t sort of tie version of Donald Trump with uh, Hillary Clinton sitting next to me. And, uh, <laughs> it puts me in a very challenging situation. But let me try to uh, get myself out of this one that I've got myself into by, by situating uh, the problem in, in an academic context. Uh, I'll show you my book cover as well. Um, didn't get me stopped at Logan, but uh, <laughs> first you've got this sort of charismatic-looking figure uh, standing up there. But the title of the book is The Taxonization of Thailand, and what I've always wanted to talk about is not so much about Taxon himself, but a set of processes which were associated with him that allowed him to achieve the very dominant position in Thai politics that he had. Now, for those people who are not so familiar with Taxon, let me just say he won the elections of 2001 and 2005, and then people who were his successors after he was no longer able to engage in politics won in 2007, and in 2011, they also so basically won elections that took place in 2006 and 2014, which were boycotted by the Democrat Party and then annulled by the courts. So it's not just one election or two elections. We're talking here about four or six elections. Take your pick. Uh, and if there were an election to be held this year or next year under the same rules as last time, there's a very high chance that some pro tax and figure would win again. So it is about this one guy, but it's not just about him because he hasn't been around for a long time. He was removed 
in a military coup in 2006, and he hasn't been back to the country since 2008. Yet he's still this incredibly dominant figure. And how do we get into this situation? We need to have a little bit of background about Thailand, and I'm conscious that I could go on for a long time because I love nothing more than to give lectures about the background in Thai politics. But for those of you who are not so familiar, uh, Thailand's absolute monarchy ended in 1932 when there was an uprising which was primarily driven by a group of elites, a mixture of military and civilian elites. Since 1932, Thailand has been struggling to find a clear political direction, torn between democratic impulses and a belief that actually uh, the military or some other key elements of the elite could rescue the country from itself. So Thailand's been going back and forth. It's had more military coups over the last hundred years than any other country in the world. It's also had more constitutions than any other country in the world. So it's also probably in the last 10 years or so had more mass political protests where large parts of the capital city were paralyzed than any other country in the world. And so it goes on. So Thailand has been in a state of incredible upheaval. It's been looking for solutions and ways out of these intractable problems for a long time, not just since Thaksin came along, but going right back uh, more than 80 years. So when Thaksin emerges, it's a particularly important point. We've heard about the economic crisis. There's also a new constitution that was promulgated in 1997. That constitution was, if you like, the most progressive, the most liberal, the most democratic constitution that Thailand has ever had. The constitution came out of a major showdown that took place in May 1992 between different political forces, essentially those elements of the military and the traditional elite that didn't want to let go of power and try to retain power even after the coup of 1991, and then emerging forces, elected politicians, civil society, other groups that felt that now is the time for these people to step aside. In 92, as had happened previously in the 1970s, there had been monarchical interventions in politics. The late king, uh, in certain narratives, comes along and plays a key role in resolving a crisis, rescuing Thailand from itself. By the beginning of the 21st century, it's clear that that's not something that can keep happening in the future. Thailand needs to stabilize its political process and institutionalize some form of representative politics, otherwise it's going to be in trouble. And the 97 constitution is supposed to set the stage for that. Uh, the constitution was drafted by a lot of lawyers. We're in a law school, so we can't say anything bad about lawyers. <laughs> but what you've seen over the past 17 years or so in Thailand is an incredible culture of legalism where different people have come along with different ideas for creating institutions that would solve Thailand's political problems. The 97 constitution has everything. It's got an election commission, a counter-corruption commission, uh, an anti-money laundering organization, a constitutional court, and Uncle Tom Cobley and all. Everything you can possibly think of, borrowed, appropriated, and modified from some other country in the world is there. So Taksin comes onto the political stage at a moment when the scene has been set for representative politics to be institutionalized. He's supposed to be the guy. The new constitution allows much more executive authority to the prime minister. It's much more difficult to get the government out of power. And he's there at the right time, apparently, to fulfill this aspiration of stabilizing Thailand's representative democracy so that the cycle of coups and street protests and royal interventions and so forth, new constitutions, will be broken. Unfortunately, that turns out not to be what's happened for a variety of reasons that we need to talk about. Well, that, that segues into, I guess, my next question. How was he uh, able to be successful in office and consolidate his power? What, was, um, what were the mechanisms and what were the manners in which he was able to do that? Well, I'll pick up from where Duncan uh, stopped, which was uh, this 1997 constitution. It was basically based on, on three main pillars, the first of which was actually it was one... That, it, that was most progressive in terms of granting people's rights and participation in politics. The second pillar was that it, was, it designed an electoral system and a parliamentary system that wanted to move Thailand away from coalition politics so that uh, the party list system was introduced, uh, 
once a government is formed in parliament, it was very difficult to remove it through parliamentary means. And the third pillar was that it would introduce a new set of checks and balance, what we call a, a network of independent organizations, so the Counter-Corruption Commission, Electoral Commission, the Admin Court, the Constitutional Court, the Ombudsman, um, whatever you have any, anywhere else in the world we had to, to, to try to do this. What Taksin cleverly did, of course, was uh, take full advantage of the second pillar, which was this strong executive um, design, and was therefore able to fulfill some of his campaign pledges and impress people that there was an effective manage management style of government. But at the same time, he used his popularity to dismantle uh, he used his money to bribe, he used his business influence to basically destroy all the checks and balance uh, in the system. But as long as people were satisfied or impressed with what the government was doing, they didn't mind. So they didn't, they didn't mind or notice that within a few years, the media had, be, had become far less independent than they were um, before, before his arrival. And uh, Thailand actually at one stage was considered to have the freest uh, press or media in the region. But uh, three or four years into Thaksin's government, we in the opposition almost had no airtime on all television stations. So basically he was driving his, mes his message through a controlled media very effectively and, as I said, when people were satisfied with the results, they didn't mind. And, of course, that included some of the worst things that he did. So many people are familiar that he was very much involved with the uh, probably one of the biggest abuses of human rights through the war on drugs and also his iron fist policy towards the Deep South, where there was a, and continues to be a separatist movement that's the right word for it. Um, and, you know, over a thousand lives were lost in the war on drugs, more than 2,000, I guess, in, uh, in the South during his time. Um, but the policies were very popular. And uh, in the Philippines now, President Duterte is actually uh, doing much more than Taksin and is extremely popular with very strong approval ratings because people felt this was a no-nonsense style of government getting things done. You know, drugs was a problem. What you have to do is to kill all the drug dealers. It didn't matter that there was no due process. Uh, it didn't matter that these people were not even, uh, have had not been proved to be involved even in, in a drugs trade. So with, with that um, um, style of government, delivering on the policies, enjoying that popularity, he also engaged in the abuses. And of course, with his business interests and conflict of interest, very much like in, in Italy, he was also able to enrich himself through these sets of policies. But people felt that, um, okay, he's corrupt, but they also have this impression that all politicians are corrupt anyway. So it, would, it was better to have somebody who was corrupt but was actually doing something that benefited them rather than being corrupt and not doing anything for them. And again, very much like Berlusconi, um, he, he almost confessed his sins too um, and also uh, was very effective at painting his enemies. That's one of the uh, tricks that we see of these populist leaders, that they're very quick to brand their opponents. So uh, us and other uh, NGOs or academics that were opposed to Taksin uh, were labeled as part of the elitist establishment, um, people who were reluctant to let go of the kind of power that they had because he was doing something new, something fresh for the overall population. And this idea that uh, he was, he says things as it is, um, outspoken, has no uh, time for political correctness. All this will sound very familiar to uh, to Americans today. Um, 
Donald Trump is especially uh, good at, at branding his opponents, you know, low energy, lion, little Marco. Very effective. Crooked Hillary, very effective. Um, so that's the kind of uh, style of government. Now, I will be fair to, to, to Taksin that he did achieve some policy success. That's something I think Donald Trump still has not yet been able to do. Um, but uh, the, the health care program was even a success. I think he, he f- inherited um, an economy that uh, was about to take off uh, at a time when interest rates were low, so people did enjoy um, strong economic growth. And he had those grassroots policies that address uh, people's concerns, not in a sustainable way, but in a way that, that uh, uh, meant that there was approval for the job that he was doing. That's the plus side. The negative side, of course, was through the corruption and through the abuses and through a very systematic dismantling of check and balance. He basically ruined all the basic institutions that need to be in place for a good functioning democracy. Uh, He rarely turned up to parliament. He doesn't even answer questions in parliament. Uh, He has no patience for any kind of uh, monitoring from anybody, very little patience for that. And all he would say is, he'll get you the results. He'll deliver the results. It doesn't matter how he does them. And I think that very much played into the emotions of uh, the majority of voters who had, I think, for so long felt that politics was not delivering something to them. And that's something that he's been able to build on. Um, and then his successors, of course, continue to build on that. And uh, the latest incarnation, of course, was when his sister became prime minister and had these really outrageous uh, policies like uh, buying up rice at about twice the market price, um, and clearly, which clearly has led to incredible amount of corruption, now uh, huge problems for uh, the government fiscally as well as the uh, the rice market. So it's taken about three or four years to undo that as well. But while it was there, people felt that something was done for them. Even the military in charge now is still really struggling because the rural farmers felt that when his sister was in power, they were getting good price for rice. They didn't really see what the damages that kind of scheme has done in the, uh, in the wider picture. Uh, Duncan, I, this characterization that he uh, talks and dismantled the checks and balances in power, I'm wondering if you agree with that um, analysis, and specifically, how did that work? And for an American audience, what should we look out for? Okay. Well, there's no doubt at all. What the interesting thing about Taxon is that uh, although he studied criminal justice, he wasn't a lawyer, but he was a former police officer. And the, a key thing to understand about him is his sort of engagement with law in a different sort of way earlier in his life. Taxon was not interested in constitutional change, which is rather novel uh, in Thailand since con- constitutional change is a bit of a fixation. And you can never, you know, in the United States, you can amend the Constitution. In Thailand, you never amend the Constitution. You shred right, anyway. it on the night of the coup, and then you com- uh, compile you know, all kinds of documents, and you appoint a vast committee of the great and the good who proceed to start from first principles and write the whole thing all over again. Uh, and this can be done any number of times, and it's been done three times in the last decade. Uh, so Taxon was not really interested in the niceties of these constitutional debates. He was really concentrating on getting stuff done and bypassing and ignoring a lot of them. But the other problem with all this is it's very easy to say that this was Taxon's fault. The lawyers and the traditional elite, whatever you want to call them, who had framed the 97 Constitution also themselves got cold feet very early on. Because what happened in 2001 is there was a court case where Taxon was being accused of not having correctly filed his assets declaration from a previous administration that actually had nothing to do with the current one. And if you followed the logic of the rules that have been put into place and found him guilty on that charge, he should have been removed from prime ministerial office just a few months after he'd won a landslide victory in the election. And 
People quickly realised that actually this wasn't necessarily going to work, that to remove him from office was going to create more problems than it would solve. So over-legalism and hyper-constitutionalism is another set of problems because the ties have turned to fixes, institutional fixes and regulations uh, as a way of boxing in these politicians. But the, the fixes are actually so draconian that they don't really work very well. And Subsequent to that, taxes, political parties were dissolved by the courts twice. He just became more popular as a result of this. Taxon himself has been removed from the country. Ying, like his sister, has been uh, spirited out of the country. None of this has really in any way worked. So it's not just that Taxon tried to subvert these constitutional provisions, which he certainly did. It's that the constitutional provisions weren't the answer to the problem in the first place. The problem was a, a deeper and more complex political problem to begin with. So people had planned place this excessive faith in the idea that you could regulate your way out of political problems. And that's, that's part of what was going on there. Well, can I, can I come back on that? Um, we have to disagree on something. Uh, indeed. Uh, um, I think it wouldn't be fair to say that the 1997 constitution provisions were impractical. I think after Thaksin, the next constitution and the current constitution has many impractical um, provisions there. Um, but it was a, it was a test. Um, and, I, and I guess this, this is a discussion we had over dinner yesterday. Um, is it time to impeach Donald Trump? What would happen if impeachment process begins? Or worse, I guess, if some kind of military takeover of Donald Trump because they're not sure he can handle the North Korean issue. How would the public react to that? Now, obviously, uh, leaving the military option aside, I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> we've had two coups. None of them work. Um, but the impeach even the impeachment process, you're faced with a choice whether you want to follow the letter and the spirit of the law, or whether you want to have political convenience. And what happened in 2001, apart from the, you said people had cold feet, there was a certain amount of lobbying and bribery involved as well. Um, somehow the court decided not to remove Taksin from office in a very curious um, verdict. This is one for the lawyers, right? Because the vote was four votes that said that uh, they shouldn't accept the case. Um, four votes that said that he was not guilty. Um, seven votes said he was guilty. And they decided that meant eight to seven of not guilty verdict. verdict. All right, so they added the four that said they, they shouldn't take the case to the not guilty um, and gave him a, a, a victory in the court. Now, since then, there was a systematic dismantling of these um, independent organizations. So basically, uh, the Senate, which was supposed to be neutral, would fill these positions. But uh, it's widely known and documented how he effectively, through his uh, money and other influences, uh, basically successfully bought the senators so that he filled these independent organizations with his own people, so that he would not come under the scrutiny um, by these independent organizations. Going back to how the Constitution was designed, remember that the Constitution placed a lot of faith on the independent organizations to allow a strong executive to bypass the traditional parliamentary um, scrutiny. That's how he successfully hung, hung on to power. Uh, we heard in the first panel about how uh, in Italy the demonization, I think is the word that was used, of Berlusconi ended up backfiring on, on his opponents to a certain extent. I'm wondering if you noticed that in the Thai context as well. And if so, how do you effectively criticize or, or um, oppose a leader like him without inadvertently strengthening him? Um, Either one of we, we had a very extensive discussion, as I said, in, in Andorra about this. Um, I think we can. We only know what you shouldn't do, <laughs> because all the things that have been tried in many, many countries, not just in Thailand, have not worked. And certainly, demonization is is one of them. 
Um, and again, the, the uh, political opponents of Donald Trump here are doing it all wrong. All right? They are still trying to attack him on his inconsistencies, on his vulgarity, on his political incorrectness, none of which matters to his supporters. And if anything, reinforces his narrative and all the populist narrative that there are a certain group of elites who are out to get him, who are out to get them, and therefore pitching all the critics against the people at large. All right, so it's the New York Times, the media here uh, have been demonized back, and it's just his words against other people's words. But because he has that uh, uh, bedrock of, of, of supporters, his base, that will stick with him, and so long as he's seen to be doing things for them, uh, none of the attacks or none of the criticisms will, will actually work. Now, the second thing, of course, which Duncan mentioned, people have tried, is, is using um, legal means. And again, that just doesn't work because um, Taksin and his people have been found guilty of a number of uh, corruption charges, uh, abuses of power. But again, um, what they do, and again, this is the experience of so many countries, is that they basically brand the courts, the judiciary, as another enemy of the people. Checking progress and uh, just using technical, legal things, and again, appealing to the idea that, don't we all do it? Everybody, does, everybody breaks the law, so why, should, uh, why shouldn't these leaders break the laws when trying to do something good for the people? So uh, we, what we've learned um, was that uh, every time that there is a, an unfavorable verdict against Taksin, the popularity of his party jumps. It's not the, it's not the standard reaction that people might feel uh, would happen, that, oh, if they're found guilty, they've been proven to be wrong, people would support them less. No. Uh, funnily enough, whenever their, their parties were disbanded, when he was convicted of, uh, and what we're seeing now with the Yingluck case, again, there's a jump in support in terms of sympathy that somehow people were using legal means to stop them from working for the people. That doesn't work either. Mm -hmm. um, coup d'etats don't work, I can assure you that. Uh, writing new constitutions, having an even more unresponsive government in place only uh, allows people to look back to the days when there were policies that actually catered um, to their needs. So. I think these are all um, these have all been tried uh, everywhere. None of these things work. I think the first panel got it right when they identify that you have to leave the leader aside and you have to look at how you can address their supporters to try to actually understand why they supported these kinds of leaders in the first place. All right. So um, for me, that means identifying. The, the, the deep-rooted sense of dissatisfaction or disillusionment or disenfranchisement from the political process. And therefore, the, the only way to win them back is to make them understand that you are concerned with their problems. All right? Um, you know, the standard reaction from what we call ourselves liberals, and I know it's a bit of a derogatory term here in, in the US, but uh, as liberals, for instance, to uh, instances of abuses of human rights and the war on drugs, we would be criticizing uh, such an abuse on uh, grounds of human rights and also legal grounds. But you know, the, the supporters of these leaders saying, well, are you gonna solve the drugs problem or not? And us and also the, the opposition in the Philippines get the same thing. 
the next thing is they brand you as being on the side of the drug dealers. All right. So the way I think to, to address these problems is to actually try to understand what it is that allowed voters to support these kinds of leaders in the first place and show that you've got better solutions. Now, one of the sad things about uh, many liberals and, and Democrats around the world is that we are very poor at connecting with people emotionally, what you call empathizing. Right? We have very rational solutions. We have very rational explanations. We are always saying the correct things, but we are not touching the hearts of these voters who feel that we don't understand them, we are isolated from them, we are different from them, not one of them. And until you can overcome that, I can't see how you can defeat these, uh, these, these types of leaders. Duncan, what lessons do you think can be learned from the, um, the opposition in Thailand and okay. why they've been ineffective, essentially? Yeah, well, you know, you're going to have a few problems if you call for a boycott of elections that you don't expect to be able to win and then sort of encourage the courts to annul the results of those elections later because that produces a long-standing sense of resentment um, if you find that one political party's activities are consistently closed down and suppressed by a whole series of legal decisions and there's never been one legal decision which in any way goes towards the opposition party, then you've got problems. And if uh, one of the main figures of your party starts a movement and takes people out onto the streets, closes down Bangkok, and effectively tries to create the conditions for a military coup, which then takes place, it's difficult for the opposition party to stand up and say, actually, we were really on your side the whole time. We weren't using these improper tactics. We weren't inciting uh, the bringing down of, of the government. We really identify with you. We really relate to you. And it's very hard to keep that story going when people see these things happen again and again and again and they start to believe, rightly or wrongly, that there's a double standard and that there are people who they have very cleverly designated the amat, the aristocrats, the enemies of the people. The ordinary people are the pry, the serfs, those who are put upon and exploited. That kind of narrative is very simplistic, but when things happen that seem to reinforce that narrative and provide evidence for it, then it's very, very easy for people, in, say in the Thai case, to evoke those narratives in support of their own position. Uh, I'll give you a quick quotation from Taxon, which dates back actually to 2003. He said, like the many philosophers who said that if you want to be a good leader, you have to be a master of storytelling, so you have to tell the public that you're leading them to a better place, otherwise the resistance to change will be too much. The problem is here that the pro taxon politicians have always had all the best lines and all the best stories. They've always been able to tell people that they were leading them to a better place. And the opposition, those who are against taxon, even if they have many arguments in their favor, they're always in this position of saying, you know, going to that place is not good. We're the ones who understand you, but on what basis? You know, the Thai electorate has been completely transformed. Huge swathes of the country in the north and northeast where most of the voters are. People have a completely different sense of their identity from people in Bangkok. So if you go and talk to people in Bangkok, they'll tell you a story about what's going on in Thailand, which bears absolutely no relation whatever to the stories that I hear when I travel around in the north and northeast. There's a massive disconnect and polarization in the society. This is not unique to Thailand. It's something we're seeing in many places, even in my own country uh, of the UK, since the Brexit vote, this sort of thing is opening up. But when you get to a point, yes, indeed, when you get to a point where people from the same family can't sit down and have dinner together, old friends who went to high school together can no longer talk to each other, this is what's been going on in Thailand for more than 10 years now. And it's a result of this intense polarization where one side has a lot of the good stories and the other side has just got itself into this constant reaction mode, coming out with frankly, very unconvincing, patronizing-sounding, non-empathetic uh, responses, which don't really wash with large swathes of the population. They wash with their base in certain parts of the country, in the capital city, in the south of Thailand. But most people in the rest of the country are very, very skeptical about those narratives. And how do you overturn that? You need to come up with a good story, which is more convincing than, no, actually, we weren't the ones who were trying to precipitate the coup. Well, people would say... 
elements who came from the Democrat Party, for example, did try to precipitate a coup in 2014, and they got one. And it's not really any use now to say, oh, we never wanted this coup after all. Well, when you went down the road of shut down Bangkok, that was the more or less inevitable outcome of what happened. So there's a problem. Once certain kinds of stories have been laid out, it's very difficult to unravel them because people out in Northeast, for example, where I go to a lot, will say, well, look at the evidence, look at the things that these people say. Yes, Abhisit's a really nice guy, and he talks very convincingly, and we like him, but look at what his party did, and look what happened. Why would we believe their stories as opposed to the stories of the pro taxon side? Uh, Abhisit, I think he's talking about you, talking about boycotts, so I thought I should give you a, a chance to respond to that. Uh, how uh, was that an effective... No, uh, no I, 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 you know... We're, we're in agreement on most of the things. Um, there may be some differences in the, the factual... Uh, <laughs> doesn't matter anymore, does it? Facts? <laughs> Facts, no. no we, we, uh, just on, the, just on the, the, the issue of the coup, actually, I was the only politician before May, the May uh, 2014 coup to actually try to propose a way out. And I was actually trying to talk Taksin's party into getting a solution whereby we would have some kind of transitional arrangement and move quickly back to elections. All right? So I was actually on record for that. Sure. Okay? Yeah. So um, I recognized full well that a coup would only damage the country and also actually play into the hands sure. of the Taksin narrative. Now, some of the members of the Democrat parties who have well, that has, has now resigned from the party, actually was taking a di very different role and is now actually still advocating a very different right. solution. Um, and, and, you know, that creates a kind of confusion among the population about where the opposition parties stand. But, um, you know, we, we've been trying to uh, uh, change our, our, our strategy and we've not been totally unsuccessful. Uh, for, for one thing, when I inherited the, uh, the Democrat Party, we were about 12 million votes behind. So we had about 7 million, and he had 19. Uh, by the time of the 2007 elections, the difference was down to 200,000 votes. Okay? Um, and uh, unfortunately, after we were in government, and uh, in the 2011 elections, that gap is widened to about uh, 2 to 3 million votes. So it shows that it's not impossible mm -hmm. to, to make some progress. And uh, I'm pleased to see that in recent polls, the most popular policy now is actually our policy on uh, taking care of elderly people. Um, it's now overtaken all of, all of Taksin's policies as the most popular public policy. The only problem is they don't really identify those policies with us. That's it because they see too many of us talking about issues that were not related to policies, because too many of us were busy demonizing, too many of us were looking at the legal techniques of how to, uh, to fight what, what Taksin was doing. So, yes, you're right, but it's not as if we don't recognize this, but it's never easy. Um, I'll, I'll go back to six months before the coup. Taksin Sisters government decided to pass a law that would grant amnesty on all the corruption cases. Right? Um, do you not expect street protests? You see that everywhere. Was it Hungary? Was it the last one? Mm -hmm. So you can't blame people for adopting certain tactics. Now, when it's proven and it was subsequently proven that uh, in some elections, they, the Taksin Party had the Electoral Commission in their hands. They were even involved in tinkling with the database of the uh, Electoral Register. Does it not make sense to boycott elections? So it's, it's always a very difficult decision because they do keep breaking the laws. And we can say, okay, well, if we take them up on these legal issues, we become unpopular. Does that mean then that we should say, well, let's forget about 
enforcing or upholding the law. It's a difficult decision, and we don't always get it right, but it's something that I think is also necessary because if these movements hadn't happened, you also have to ask, where would Thailand be now? It would be under um, a complete domination of a force that is corrupt, that is able to abuse power, that would actually basically throw out all the institutions and rules of a proper liberal democracy. The irony is, because of the popularity, they somehow represent democracy, when in fact uh, Thaksin has no interest at all in upholding a system of democracy. I'll give you two quotes. He said earlier in his uh, first uh, term of government that democracy should only be seen as a means. It's not an end in itself. So he gets into power and he will do good things for people. Once he's elected, you can forget about all the other rules of democracy. The other statement that he made was that in his ideal world, Thailand would be a one-party state. All right? Actually, he said, well, we'll allow for maybe one or two opposition members, like in Singapore or something. But uh, that's his vision of, govern, of, of system of government. Now, I know that some of the moves that we've made were probably proven wrong, or certainly from the point of view of popularity had been proven wrong. But had we not done those things, there is this real question about where Thailand would be now in terms of system of government or even having any kind of uh, rule of law at all. Um, one of the things that came up in the previous panel that I thought was interesting was that uh, one of the factors that played a role in Berlusconi's rise was the, that the pl traditional political parties had been so hurt by, by anti-corruption investigations, um, if that's a good summary of uh, what happened there. Um, do you, what was the, for what are the status of the political parties in Thailand and how have they adjusted um, to Thaksin? Quite sure I understand the question. <laughs> well, let, let me try and answer that one. <laughs> um, basically, um, before Taksin, we would have about maybe five, six political parties of comparable size. All right. When Taksin entered politics, basically he gathered all the non-democrats into his camp. Uh, first, before the elections of two thousand one. And then subsequently, after he became prime minister, he took over the smaller parties and absorbed them into his party. All right? So basically, after Taksin, we moved to basically a two-party system. And following the previous coup 10 years ago, um, there were feeble attempts to set up more political parties to try to take some of the support away from Taksin's party and basically failed because they were able to hang on to, to their supporters and basically the opposition becomes even more fragmented. And there continues to be, I believe, a clumsy attempt to do the same again after this coup. Duncan, can the political parties um, sort of play a role, a uh, greater role? Uh, I guess what I'm getting at in the question is there's, when Donald Trump was uh, going through the nomination process, there were a lot of Republicans who were horrified by him, but they lacked the means to really stop him. Um, and uh, there's, there's been questions since about what the future of the Republican Party would look like if it can provide an effective check on the president. Is that something that uh, the, the high experience has anything to teach us about? Was the party an effective check on Toxin in any way? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the problem, we tend to have these notions about political parties, which are rather idealized, that like we would like to think that political parties have mass memberships and that they convene and make decisions about their collective policies and that party leaders go into elections wielding manifestos that have been agreed by the party and then the party members go and knock on people's doors. And this is a kind of fantasy of a political party uh, that's based on sort of European parties of the 1970s or something. But it's not really working very well anywhere. I mean, the US has always had a rather odd 
political party system. I never studied it closely, but it doesn't exactly follow that model to begin with. Thailand's never got there. In Thailand, there's always been this aspiration that somehow we could create these real parties. And that was part of the constitutional engineering of 97 too. We'll give you money to set up branches for your party. So you end up with parties with no MPs, no representatives anywhere, with branches all over the country, supposedly, and collecting lots of money from the election commission uh, for doing nothing. So you can't sort of... Yeah, you can't institutionalise a party without any real ideological basis. And it's more or less fair to say that there's, there's no clear, very strongly clear ideological basis for political parties in Thailand. So Thaksin's party was primarily a vehicle for him and his interests. That said, it became you know, a large organization and it had sufficient capacity to reinvent itself and rebrand itself each time it was closed down and dissolved. So there are party activists and loyalists to some extent in various provinces, particularly in the strongholds in the north and the northeast. You know, Democrat Party strong in, in the Bangkok and parts of the south. But are these parties that in the, the model that we would really understand them, where the party can hold the leadership to account and so on? Not really. It's not really working like that. It's, it's a very different kind of political system. And it's unlikely that any new European 1970s-style parties are going to be created anywhere that they haven't already emerged. So this is a, something that we political scientists would love to find. You know, Let's create a new ideological party with members and branches that would be real and that would hold people to account. But... I just, I just don't think it's going to happen either in Thailand, the US, or anywhere else where it hasn't happened before. There's well, another. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Let, let, let me add to that. Um, uh, just like our Italian friends, um, Taksin's party is basically Taksin's party. All right? Just as uh, I think Berlusconi would not allow the party to have uh, a life of its own, uh, there's no way that uh, Taksin will allow his party to, to, to have a life. Uh, of its own. Now, we, the Democrats in Thailand, are probably closest to what uh, the Western ideal is, and we've been trying to build that for over seven decades now. Um, but the frustrating thing now is I'm not even sure that voters see the value of having these ideal organizations as political parties. They're less interested about how you're going to formulate your policies. They're more interested about what parties will deliver for them. So actually, it now works against us that they see us as, as weak because unlike Taksin, I don't own the party. I have to be accountable to my members, to the branches, to the MPs. So they see that as weak leadership, whereas Taksin can just call the shots and... Uh, make all the decisions straight away. So I think you're seeing the same things here in, 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 in the U.S., what I call a hostile takeover of the Republican Party by, by, by Donald Trump. Um, and, and he'll be judged um, on, on his achievements and results rather than we ha whether he actually builds the Republican Party along institutional lines. And that is why one of the concerns that I'd like to convey is that if voters and if the electorate become less concerned with the democratic process, if they are less concerned with the means by which government is conducted, then the populace will have a much, much better chance of succeeding because they would be the ones that were seen as results-oriented, are not bound by the rules to deliver what needs to be delivered to the people. And worse than that, I, I guess, uh, because we already talked about social media and the internet, uh, now that when societies become polarized and segmented, it is extremely difficult to communicate to people on the other side. That's the problem, that once these people have a hold of a base which consists of the majority, all they need to do is retain that base. You still have a chance here in the U.S. because Donald Trump does not have the majority of people voting for him. Only the Electoral College system has put him where he is. But if he has a lock on that kind of majority, all he needs to do is to basically please his base. Thaksin famously said, and there are a few leaders who, who say it like it, 
that he would only work for people who voted for him. And he actually allocated budget, the national budget, that way too. Any province, any region that didn't vote for him, he would not allocate budget to build infrastructure, roads, or solve those people's problems. And he says that that's the way it should be done. That's effective management. People should know that if they don't vote for him, this is what they'll get. Um, at least in the United States, it hasn't quite gotten to that point yet. We haven't seen uh, partially and, and, because and, the president yeah, has and, not. And the other thing, of course, is that uh, you still I'm, still, I'm still waiting to see how well your institutions hold up against taxing as well. Well, this was leading into my question, which is uh, for both of you, but uh, from the perspective of an outsider who's um, studied these political systems in other countries, do you think that the system of checks and balances is holding up so far in the United States? Are, are, are there things you would interpret as warning signs? Yes, I've never, I've never taken any courses on uh, American politics, so I can't say that I'm really very expert on it. Uh, you can, you know, anybody who's familiar with the Thai case or other cases in Southeast Asia, and many of these problems exist in parallel forms in other countries in Southeast Asia, whether we're talking about Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, and, and so on, or Cambodia at the moment, um, will recognize the, the kind of problems that can start to emerge. But I guess the American system hasn't really been put to the test as often. I mean, a, a system like in most of these Southeast Asian countries, the political crises are more frequent and we see things come to the fore more regularly. We haven't since the 1970s seen, for example, the implications of things like the 25th Amendment and, and so on. So uh, it's all going into fairly new territory. But, you know, those of us who've been watching <laughs> Southeast Asia closely will be somewhat alarmed because, you know, what we found is that these nice constitutional legal solutions, I, and I went to, to Gerald Ford's uh, grave and uh, presidential museum uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, a few years ago, and there's a wonderful plaque there. It says that ours is a government of laws and not men. Uh, that was certainly true when he became president. Let's hope that it's still a government of, of laws and not men today. <laughs> well, let me give you an example. Um, Trump's immigration control mm. order. Now, he was in a win-win situation. I mean, if the court allowed him to go ahead, he would have one achievement chalked up. If the court strikes it down, he will just say, the courts are the enemy of the people. This, is what, I mean, this has been happening to us year in, year out. And I don't have an answer. What should the courts do? For me, the courts still have to uphold the law. But we somehow have to deal with the consequences as far as the popularity or the political impact is concerned. Uh, well, I'd like to get to a few questions before we wrap it up. So uh, would anybody like to uh, ask questions of our panelists? Yes. So we can, yeah. and we can hear it at the back. Um, this is really addressed to Kun Afisit. So you touched on a rift within the party be between current leadership and Sote. So given this fragmentation, <laughs> um, the staying power of Taksin's legacy and what Professor McCargo described as a legitimate sense of betrayal with a party that has stood for the rule of law against recognizing vast swathes of the people, how do you see the Democrat Party as being relevant in Thailand in any other way than as an opposing force? Well, I think... With the current situation, it becomes a lot clearer now that uh, the PDRC and the SUTEP uh, have different um, visions or solutions for the country from what the Democrat Party has. Okay? Um, we were and remain united in our fight against corruption, uh, in uh, supporting reforms, but uh, I think we, we now clearly see the differences between the PDRC and the Democrat Party about how we should move ahead. Right. Thank you for a fascinating panel. Prime Minister, this is a question for you about the court decision that led to um, Taksin's removal. Why did the case focus on such a trivial form of corruption, given what you've said about the deep background of malpractice? In so many ways, that undermined the legitimacy of the decision. For those who don't know that, it was that he appeared on a cooking show 
and therefore took a, a fee, if you like. No, I'm wrong. <laughs> that's a different prime minister. Sorry. No. So okay, that's, right. So that's, that's Sir Max Anton Wait. Yeah. Okay. So the the first decision. I mean, I'm interested in the sense that your, your main point is still valid. Right? But your main if, point if you can answer the kind of how did the Democrats think about this in terms of. There was a lot there. Is this the only thing that was provable in this latest instance earlier on? Why were these the cases that were brought and how involved were the opposition in the legal strategy versus it being a more uh, independent, if you like, set of uh, litigation? Well, the, the technical answer to that would be that there are actually about five other cases pending. That was the simplest one and therefore uh, got a verdict and then he, of course, um, fled the country, and therefore the, all the other cases could not proceed. But uh, for me, that would be a very uninteresting uh, answer. Uh, the, the, problem, the problem is this. He, he, is, he was convicted very much basically on the issue of conflict of interest. right? And, and what we've learned is that, and I get asked a lot by, uh, by uh, Western friends, you know, why do we have these laws that are so petty, dealing with all the small, you know, violations? But the issue is, um, in most Western democracies, if you engage in those practices, you would be held accountable politically, and most likely you would not be able to hold on to office, all right, without the legal cases which suggests to me that uh, uh, legal provisions can be no replacement for a strong political culture that holds up accountability. But creating that culture is a lot more difficult, of course, than writing an article in a law that, that, uh, that makes these things illegal. Hi, um, this is a question for either of you. Um, Mr. Apisit, you mentioned that if you, um, I'm sorry, um, if the Democrat Party did not in some way um, create it or be a, play a part of the movement that created finally uh, bringing down of uh, the Thaksin and his friends uh, government, you are afraid that if those protests did not happen, Thaksin will finally dismantle democracy in Thailand. But now that all the protests and everything happened, and Thaksin and his friends are now down, and there is no democracy, um, uh, how would you uh, explain to that? I would like to hear from uh, Dan Ken as well. So well, well as I said before the coup, I had proposed an alternative solution actually explicitly stating to the public that something had to be done to avoid a coup. But it needed the cooperation of the then governing party, uh, and they refused to explore that option. So um, this is not where we'd like to be, but it doesn't take away the necessity of some of the actions that we had to take to oppose some of the actions that were taken by Taxing his people. So, for instance, um, the amnesty bill, if that were passed into law, it would be, I think, probably the first time that uh, a country says it was all right to be corrupt. So long as you have the power, you can engage in corruption, and then you can forgive yourself because you have a majority. Do we want to go there? I don't think we do. Yeah, I mean, clearly the amnesty bill was a, was a very problematic episode, and we talk about that for some time. But the point is the amnesty bill was withdrawn, and the Bangkok shutdown protest took place after the amnesty bill had been withdrawn sure. and after the, the election had been called. Sure. So the question is really why at some point things couldn't have been scaled down so that we didn't get to the point where you had to make your right. last-minute unsuccessful but well-intentioned intervention to try to head off the coup after people had set things up for precisely that coup to take place. Um, but, of course, the counterfactual question is, OK, suppose there... But really, the question is... Had there not been a coup, where would we be now? Would we be in an even worse situation? It's a little bit hard to see how we could be in a much worse situation than we're already in because people. No, have no, no, a, no, no. Uh, we would not. I'm not <laughs> saying that we would be in a in a in a uh, in a worse place with with 
not the coup. I was saying the amnesty bill. Right, right? but the amnesty bill is long gone, isn't so it? So once, well, <laughs> to, by the time we get to technically, technically they said they withdrew it temporarily. All right, okay. Maybe I shouldn't take maybe I shouldn't take them literally, but uh, <laughs> take but them that's seriously. What, but that's what they said. That's what they said. But no, the, my point was that uh, we couldn't allow things like the amnesty bill. We couldn't allow certain cases of corruption to go unchecked. But once, as you said, the protest moved on, I agree with you that we shouldn't have had the coup. And I believe that the, if the military didn't step in, then maybe the parties might be able to find a joint solution, which would, for me would have been best for the country. Right. So in these, the, we're dealing with counterfactuals here, and it's yeah. very difficult. But I think we would all hope that the, if the coup had been averted, we wouldn't be in the desperate situation we right. are now, because it's very difficult to see how we could be in a substantially worse situation, even if uh, we want to demonize all pro tax and governments and assume that continuing pro tax and government up to this very day would have been horrendous. I don't know whether it would have been as bad as the situation we're in now, where we have no real sense of a way forward. And, and uh, the other thing, Look, when you talk about what, solutions... We need to get some more, yeah. more questions here. Just, just <laughs> one very important point about solutions. You know the policies that were problematic? The ideal scenario was to allow those policies to fail in Thaksin's hands. Sure. And it didn't happen because of the coups. That's why I agree with you that coups are not the answers. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, could I have a question for you, if I may? Um, nobody would accuse you, I think, of being a populist. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can take that as a compliment if you wish. But um, uh, clearly, the yellow shirts, uh, who after all were closely associated in the popular mind and in real politics, I think, with the Democrat Party, were taking a very populist line. Uh, in particular, of course, Sutep uh, was the prime mover of what was the proximate cause uh, cited by the coup leaders uh, for, for their intervention. Why did the Democrat Party not dissociate itself more strongly uh, from the yellow shirts? And in retrospect, do you regret the fact that the party did not do so? That's a really difficult one. Um, I've got a party member with me here today. <laughs> um, I'm sure she will appreciate the, the, the sensitivity. It's, it's always difficult when a substantial part of your political base uh, splits off and has its own agenda. Now, I thought I was clear enough before the coup that I didn't agree with them, and I know that a lot of them were very angry with me. Just as when I came out against the current constitution, I got a lot of stick from people who supported the Democrat Party. Actually, I would say about maybe even 30 to 40 percent at least of my supporters were unhappy with my decision not to support the Constitution. It's not, it's not an easy decision. Uh, I have no excuses. I thought I'd try to strike the right balance, uh, sticking to my beliefs, making my beliefs known, but trying not to alienate my support base too much because the last thing we also need is a fragmented opposition to the other side. Speaking of fragmented opposition, if I could want make one point, what, what advice would you give, either of you, or I guess primarily you, give to the Democratic Party in the United States now? Oh, what, what, what would, would be the way to sort of forward to um, address their own divisions and in, in trying, uh, trying to oppose the Trump presidency? Well, not, number one, not to be distracted by his tweets. <laughs> um, and number two, um, really get down to the, to the issues. Um, you know, Hillary lost because of the industrial belt. And that should have been something that the Democrats could have held on to. But uh, she lost her, um, she got out of her supposed message box over the last couple of weeks. She stopped talking about jobs. She stopped talking about the economy. She went on a sort of demonization of, of Trump in the last couple of weeks. And, and so the Democrats have to get over that now address why it is that people were unhappy, despite strong approval for President Obama until today, unhappy with the party. 
in terms of not somehow delivering or addressing what they see as their, their prime concerns. Is there one last question in the back? Uh, yes, thank you to the speakers again for a really wonderful uh, continuation of this uh, panel. You know, everybody here understands what the stakes seem to be, um, and we have a lot to learn from previous instances of this going on. Um, Argentina in the 50s, uh, Toxenism, and um, now the moment that we appear to be in. So if I'm understanding you correctly, maybe a way out would be inspiring people to remember that the political processes matter, no matter what those processes are, right? So do you have any stories of that happening anywhere that you could lift up and give us kind of hope? <laughs> That's my question. That's a nice question to end on. Well, yeah, total hope is hard to find. Uh, we did have an election in, in my own country, Britain, recently, and I don't claim to be any sort of soothsayer or expert on the politics of my own country, but I was in a panel at Fordham University the day after Theresa May called the election, and I was asked by the moderator, I was supposed to be talking about Asia, and the moderator said, what do you think about Britain? I said, I'd be really surprised if this went Theresa May's way, uh, because I don't think she can engage with people emotionally. Uh, and I was right. Corbyn was able to engage with people emotionally in a way that Theresa May never was. Now, he has his own problems, as Sanders had his own problems here in the U.S., but maybe the, the only answer is that you have to fight a certain kind of populism with a more progressive politics that takes some of the lessons from populism. People who have this... And funnily enough, I don't know why these... The people who've been more successful are these old men uh, in a society where we're being told generational change is so important and it's all about getting the youth. But somehow you have to find people who can reach out to voters uh, in a way that counters this darker kind of populism with a more progressive kind of... Um, set of agendas and ideas. And, but the key thing is those people have to be able to engage with the voters emotionally as well, because otherwise they're finished, they're going nowhere. Great, well thank you very much to both of you.